Well, in this talk, I should be concentrating on me uh, methods for dense symmetric matrices, uh, perhaps the least controversial part in, in the handbook. Perhaps nice to start off with an easy one. Um, so I'm going to be concerned then with matrices A, real and symmetric, and uh, uh, non-sparse, or at least if they have some zeros, not sufficiently a number of them to uh, try to take advantage of them. The first um, method in the handbook associated with that is perhaps the one of the best known of these methods. It's one of the few uh, classical methods which is still used in very much the form in which it was originally proposed. There have been uh, minor improvements. This too is based on the use of um, plane rotations. It makes use of the fact that we know that in a real, uh, the case of a real symmetric matrix, it can be reduced to uh, diagonal form and by means of an orthogonal transformation. And it attempts to do that uh, reduction, uh, deriving the orthogonal transformation as the product of a sequence of plane rotations. Uh, the sequence, of course, is an, an infinite sequence in general. And what we do is we continue until we reduce A to diagonal form, uh, to working accuracy, whatever that mysterious term really means. So this is the, the classical Jacobi uh, process was this. You had your matrix, a typical stage. You looked for the A was successively transformed by plane rotations, gradually becoming uh, diagonal as time, uh, as time went on. And at the typical stage, you looked for the large, the off-diagonal element of largest modulus. And then you uh, performed the plane rotation. If, if it was an ij element, you multiply by rij and rijt, choosing the angle of rotation in such a way as to make the ij element, to annihilate the ij element. And uh, the proof of convergence was really quite simple you found that if you consider the uh, sum of the squares of the off-diagonal elements, and then this is decreased, it's equal to the odd sum of the squares, minus uh, the square of the elements that have been reduced to zero. So, no, that's quite simple to prove. It doesn't depend on anything more subtle than the sum of the squares of sine and cosine being one. And since Aij has been chosen to be the largest of the off-diagonal elements, Two of them, be, uh, two of the, the two largest ones have become zero, and so you're reducing it uh, by um, one minus two over n squared minus n. That means that s bar squared is less than or equal to that, because you're diminishing the sum by two of the largest elements, and therefore um, <coughs> you've got a progressive decrease in the sum of the squares of the off-diagonal elements, and the thing will ultimately become diagonal. Uh, later, it was proved that, uh, the, that the process ultimately became quadratic, that when the off-diagonal elements got small enough, it suddenly uh, started to gallop and uh, became quadratic. Uh, this proof only gradually evolved. First of all, there was considerable anxiety about uh, uh, multiple roots. The proof didn't go through with multiple roots. Then it was found that it went through with a double root, but nothing of higher multiplicity. And then it was finally proved that it was quadratically convergent uh, in all cases. And in fact, it was rather ironic that it, it took a while to get round to that proof, because in fact, the more, the higher the multiplicities, the faster it is. In fact, it's remarkably fast if they're all equal, uh, since it starts off as a, a scalar matrix, and it doesn't require any then. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if they're all equal except one, it takes one transformation, and, and Having spotted those two facts, you begin to realize, in spite of the fact you haven't been able to prove it, it must really be better uh, when you have multiple roots. And at last, we showed that it was. Um, the method is very nice because it just consists of the one uniform process, uh, just annihilating this largest off-diagonal element and continuing until you can regard the off-diagonal elements as negligible. You only just the one process. And if you want the eigenvectors, of course, you form the product of all the transformations, and that will give you the matrix of eigenvectors. Uh, generally speaking, it's not easy to modify it in such a way as to make it 
find just a few of the eigenvalues. Um, various techniques have been uh, described for trying to order them and to cut down on the amount of work, but I don't think they've really been successful, and by and large it's used for finding all of them. Um, now, Jacobi's, that was the original Jacobi classical process. He was looking for the largest off-diagonal element. I'll say a little bit more on the mechanics of the thing in a minute. Uh, but, of course, um, that uh, looking for the largest off-diagonal element was by no means the most arduous thing as long as you were doing it with pencil and paper. The tiresome thing was actually doing, doing the transformation. When you do it on a computer, the time taken to find the largest element is really uh, quite substantial, and so various mod minor modifications were developed. Uh, perhaps the most important of these was the uh, threshold method in which at any given time you're prepared to annihilate only those elements which are a reasonable size and you miss out the minnows as you go uh, scaling through. Clearly this is a good thing to do and you only decrease the sum of the squares by the square of the two elements, the two symmetric elements you annihilate, and so you obviously want to do the big ones. Uh, but instead of, um, instead of searching every time for the largest one, you just go through them sequentially, and on any given uh, run through, you will skip those, uh, you will skip those uh, uh, smaller than a certain size, and therefore uh, a whole uh, generation of uh, threshold v v versions of the, uh, of the standard Jacobi thing arose. Um, I suppose uh, the first change was, in fact, just to do them sequentially, ignoring the size. That's usually referred to as the standard serial one, going through them one by one in that order and then going uh, back to the top. Um, so with regards to proofs of convergence, these two have sort of slowly progressed. Uh, uh, in fact, it's very easy to say that with any reasonable threshold method, the thing is ultimately quadratic converg quadratically convergent. And that is, the, that is the general position. It's quite fascinating to watch, watch the process. In fact, uh, on a cathode ray tube, we certainly used to use, watch it a lot in the early days when we had mu much more interaction with the computer. And um, uh, we were using the serial method with, with threshold, and uh, we, um, uh, we tend to speak in, in terms of unit of one complete sweep. And what usually used to happen was uh, about three sweeps took place and nothing much seemed to happen then on the fourth. Uh, uh, all the numbers will go down to about half size, that is half number of digits, and the next time they will vanish. And that was fairly conclusive. Looking at it, the quad quadratic nature of it was, was really very evident. And uh, of course, we have this global property as well. Uh, uh, in practice, of course, it's a good deal stronger than this. Um, but one interesting thing about the, um, the actual version of it that's published in uh, the handbook uh, is due to Rutishauser, and as always seems to be the case with almost anything Rutishauser does, he has extraordinary knack of spotting something that nobody seems to have noticed before, even in, in, a, in a piece of theory, which in this case is perhaps uh, the oldest of any that we use in connection with the eigenvalue problem. Uh, the general situation is having decided on, uh, on annihilating a certain element, you, you have to multiply by your cos sine minus sine cos. And typical uh, elements, uh, apart these four elements, of course, get modified both on the pre-modification and the post-modification. But typical elements here, A and B, become A cos plus B sine minus uh, A sine plus B cos. And what about the four elements here? I call them X, Y, and Z. They uh, get treated on both occasions, and um, you, the z it, it becomes zero. That's the whole object of the thing. That's how the angle of rotation is, uh, uh, is chosen. That's the basis of the, the Jacobi method. But x, x prime, the new x, becomes x cos squared plus 2z cos sine plus y sine squared, and y prime equals minus x sine squared plus 2z uh, x sine squared minus 2z cos sine plus uh, y cos squared. Sum of the squares, of course, remaining um, the same. So, so, some of them, rather, remaining the same, uh, since the trace is going to remain constant. Nice to see that consistency coming out again. <laughs> well, 
those formulae, I suppose, have existed through the ages. I mean, before anybody was interested in much in Jacobi's method, um, it must have been in, in books on conic sections, say, on how to reduce the principal axes. And when Rutteshauser's paper came to me, uh, I was looking at it and I saw that x prime is equal to x plus z tan theta and y prime is equal to uh, y minus z tan theta. Um, and those, those uh, I s was the first thing I sort of noticed about it. And I wondered what the devil they were and whether he was doing something I entirely different. And until I uh, started to work and realized that these do indeed uh, reduce to those when a tan theta is chosen in such a way as to make the new z prime zero. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as I know, uh, Rudishauser was the first to notice it, and I would have thought the chances of anybody doing it were so slight because one would always thought, well, this has existed so many years, if there were anything really different, it would have been spotted by now. Rudishauser is not the sort of man to, to be put off by that type of argument. <laughs> well, the thing is that tan 2 theta is, in fact, 2z over uh, x minus y. If you work out the formulae for the, for the new z prime, you find that they will vanish if uh, tan 2 theta is chosen in this way. And uh, this gives you t two essential choices of theta. And in fact, you choose the value of theta so that as z turns to zero, um, the angle tends to, uh, the angle of rotation tends to zero. Obviously, it's a sensible thing to do so that whole thing settles down. It's rather interesting about this method. It, it appears to have been rediscovered by von Neumann and Goldstein. And I think its use in the high-speed computer world uh, is due to their uh, championing of its cause. So we did, in fact, use it at MPL earlier on a desk machine, and I think we saw it in a, uh, a little set of notes which came from Aronshine. Um, on a desk computer, in an extremely unpalatable process, <laughs> because um, there you write down your matrix, uh, probably taking advantage of symmetry or not, as the taste may go, but when you do a transformation, you have to alter all the elements in, in these two rows and two columns. And you're faced with two miserable choices. Either you can cross out what you've got and write in the new ones, or you can write the whole darn thing out again. And neither is a good solution. So that it's a, it's a very unchristian process to do on the desk machine, and it didn't make a very big impression on us. And there you get the great advantage of a high-speed computer, that when you write that you overwrite a number, it automatically destroys the other one. This, um, this uh, simple property of it makes an enormous difference. It means the difference between doing it on a desk machine and a high-speed computer is very, very substantial. And when um, the process came up again, we got out, we did find out the old sheets on which it had been done. It was done by a, a rather good desk computer, extremely reliable computer, but we found to her amusement that she hadn't taken the smaller angles and so that the angles had tended to pi by four. And so if you look at the sheets, it, it, it was swinging around all the time. Right at the end when it was converging, the diagonal elements were being moved around in a most absurd fashion because it doesn't affect the convergence. Or <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> well, there isn't too much to say about that method. It's very straightforward, a very compact code, I think, in some ways, still the most elegant. You, you don't have a mixture of... of, of of um, strategies, you've just got the one thing uh, the, uh, and, and you can decide, wh decide whether you want the vectors or not. Um, pro probably about the smallest of the programs. Uh, Rudishelzer was always very attached to it and he always maintains that if you just want to use in the course of a rather larger problem to solve a small, uh, s solve a subsidiary eigenvalue problem, uh, then you ought to be using Jacobi and he uh, did so, in fact, in RETSET, which is a routine that occurs later I I in the book. I, th I think there's something to be said for it. Certainly, uh, I'm pleased that some version of Jacobi is in the handbook. It's, it's a grand old method, and there's a certainly, uh, it's certainly nice for it not, it not to disappear entirely. He has one or two other nice features about it, which are designed to minimize rounding off. Uh, effects, and I think in some cases are really quite important. But as far as the general use of, of, the, uh, of the routine is concerned, I, I don't think they are substantial. <laughs>
Perhaps at this point I should say a final thing about its numerical stability. It's very stable. You can show that the uh, final matrix, the final diagonal matrix, is exactly similar uh, to, um, an uh, to a real symmetric matrix which differs uh, from the original one by something for which you can get a fairly good bound for the norm. Of course, it involves the number of iterations take, taken, but we know from experience that's of the order of five or six, and sometimes appreciably less. And so the process is very stable. Also, the error analysis shows that the vect computed vectors will be almost exactly orthogonal, and that this measure of orthogonality is in no way diminished uh, by the inaccuracy of them, if I may put it that way. Um, the eigenvalues are always accurate, and since they are eigenvalues of A plus E, where E is small, uh, where E is, the, e, the norm of E is small compared with the norm of A, e, e, B, e also being symmetric, all the eigenvalues are accurate. And I want to emphasize, perhaps I don't need to for an audience like this, that multiplicity of eigenvalues should not have any harmful effect on the accuracy of eigenvalues. Eigen, uh, close eigenvalues or coincident eigenvalues should be found just as accurately, whatever their multiplicities. Um, of course, it only guarantees that, that they have small errors relative to the norm, which in this case is small errors relative to the largest eigenvalue. It doesn't guarantee and cannot that the smaller ones have a higher relative accuracy, or small errors relative to the norm. Now, what about the snide remark I made about the vectors? Well, that same criticism has to be applied to all methods, uh, uh, all the algorithms in our handbook and elsewhere, when, when the vectors are found, because the simple point is that although the eigenvalues, whether multiple or not, are insensitive to small perturbations, the eigenvectors, of course, are. And when you get close eigenvectors, small changes will send them swivelling round within the subspace associated with the close eigenvalues. And what it always does is, is get eigenvalues, which you can, as good as can be respected, expected, have in regard to the precision of computation you're, you're using. The fact that they are go still going to be accurately orthogonal is a bonus, and in many, uh, many applications, it is essential to have near or almost exact orthogonality um, for, for, for independent reasons. So the vectors are about as nice as you can get, and as, as good as given by any of the other algorithms. Some of the algorithms that we use have rather fewer rounding errors, and so there's slightly less accumulation, but it's, it's not a terribly important effect. Okay, well, I, I don't think there's anything else worth saying about the Jacobi. Uh, I think it is nice that a method as, as old as that should have stood up so well, and it still, it still, is, a, it still is a very good method. Almost all the other methods are based on a pre preliminary reduction to tridiagonal form. Start off with a symmetric matrix A, and by an orthogonal similarity, you reduce it to tridiagonal form. This, I suppose, was first done, well, numerical analysts uh, first used it uh, as a result of Given's paper. He wrote this paper in 54, uh, it was published, I think, and this reduced A to tridiagonal form by means of um, plane rotations. Now, whereas this, this, this uh, Jacobi method is essentially iterative, it uh, makes an off-diagonal element zero, but then subsequent transformations uh, bring it back non-zero again, so only gradually do you annihilate the thing. Uh, the reduction to tridiagonal form is done in a finite number of steps, and in fact it involved in the Gibbons process half n into n minus one plane rotations. Now uh, that's the only time I should say half n into n minus one because I usually get such things wrong. From now on I shall say half n squared and um, so I won't have to worry about whether it's really half n into n plus one or half n to n minus one <laughs> or some, uh, some similar thing of that kind. Right, well, in the, uh, Given's process um, was overtaken by Householder's method And the burden of what I should be saying on, on Thursday is that perhaps it shouldn't have been, and possibly if we did the handbook all over again, um, a householder might well disappear now and we'll be back 
to Gibbons, uh, done in a different way, without square roots, and without the four multiplications here, back to, back to, back to two. And whereas I think a year ago, I think that was something of a conjecture, I would say um, things have gradually improved o over, over the last year, and now I think I'm almost certain that if we did it all over again, we will be using, we will be using Gibbons. However, I not anticipate Thursday's lecture, and I concentrate on the things that are in the handbook, and there we do it by householder, because as described by Gibbons and householder, the advantages are, as far as multiplication is concerned, about two to one in favor of householder, and as far as square roots are concerned, um, the f uh, in favor of householder, but to the tune of about n to half n squared. So here's the process. We take our matrix A, and by a series of elementary Hermitian transformations, it's great the things are symmetric so that one doesn't have to foul it up by g minus n minus 2. Foul it up by putting the transpose. One reduces it to tridiagonal form. Well, the process takes place um, uh, step by step, and after, after the typical situation is this, you've already got it tridiagonal in the early in the early part of the matrix. You've got it tridiagonal up here, and the next stage is, is to get rid of this and this. Perhaps I want to make it a little bigger in order to uh, make it typical. Well, at this stage, then, what do we want to do? We want to make these elements zero. And of course, we're going to, symmetry is going to preser be preserved all the time, and so we'll make these elements zero. And we will do it by multiply, uh, and all the weight of these things will be concentrated on there. This element will become plus or minus the square root of the sum of the squares of the elements that are there. So we'll do it by, by pre multiplying by the appropriate PR, and <coughs> the the R will have zero elements in all the early positions, and the, uh, the non-zero elements will be determined just by these elements here in the way that I described in my first lecture. They involved S, square root of the sum <coughs> of the squares of the elements, and these elements uh, here. Since PR will be associated with the UR, which is null in, in these rows, the um, the zeros so painstakingly introduced will be preserved, and so you just have a finite process, yeah, and the work at each stage gets less and less, because when we multiply by the PR, it affects only this part of the matrix. It's important that this process should be done in a way that preserves symmetry. Uh, so we, we get our UR uh, in the... Uh, we use non-normalized UR, as I described in my first lecture, and the most of their components are the elements that are already here, except that one, which is square root of the sum of the squares minus its true, uh, is equal to the value there minus the square root of the sum of the squares. And so in, in order to remember what's happened, you just leave the elements in position, uh, because in the, next, in the next transformation, they're going to be zeros anyway. Since you know that, you can use the storage to to, to store most of your UR. So the, 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 the typical stage is the determination of that, K, K being half the norm of the unnormalized URs. And one has to do that in the most economical way possible. And you write this as AR minus UR U R T A R. Okay. Uh, minus um, A R U R T. So A R U R U R T over K. Uh, plus U R U R T U R U R T over K squared. And this, this thing in the middle of it is, is a scalar here. So that if we, if we write if you were to write a UR, AR, UR, 
equal to, to PR, see? This then becomes AR minus UR PRT over K minus PR URT over K plus um, this, th this inner product here I just called alpha over K alpha, so it's K squared there. Alpha over K squared UR URT. And now the convenient way of, of doing it is to uh, share this bit between those two so as to get a thing uh, which, uh, uh, in which the symmetry is still obvious. Um, so, uh, I've missed out the AI. I thought there was something wrong there. So that, so that this is URTPR, but it's still alpha. So uh, no great harm was done. Um, we want to do this in a convenient way, and we put half of this in with each one. Uh, so I can put this as AR minus UR into PRT over K and uh, minus half URT over K squared. Uh, and then minus the transpose of this thing into URT. And this thing here I call QRT, and this is QR. And that exposes the, the essential symmetry of the process, and all I have to do is to compute. Uh, have, having produce, uh, produced the vector PR, I produce QR from it, and that is the way in which it's, it's coded in the book. It makes, it, uh, it makes uh, all the algebra quite simple and symmetry preserved quite automatically. And of course, one only produces the upper half of the matrix. It's a very good recipe for maintaining symmetry is just to compute one half of the matrix. It works like a charm. Well, that's the es essential um, work that's done in thread, in, in, in the algorithms thread. There's thread one, thread two, and thread three, and they are minor variants of the same process, and they're really concerned with what you're going to do next, and also with economy of storage. Um, the thread two is the one that I've always liked. The thread two is used when you're going to find the eigenvalues, and, uh, when you're going to find all the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and it's going to be followed by TQL2 or MTQL2. Uh, it, it does the process that we've described here, um, and uh, remembers all the information that's, uh, that's required in the PRs, and remember the information that's required is the elements of the URs themselves, and they will mainly already be in positions because the U elements of the UR at any stage are the current elements of the matrix apart from uh, the top one. The only other things you've got to remember are minus or plus S, uh, XR plus or minus S, and S squared plus or minus XSR. And you see you'd only have to, um, uh, if you remember those two, uh, then you've, you've got that one. And so this leads to e economy uh, in the, uh, as far as the memory process is concerned. The S is actually going to be stored in that position because it's the new element, the new subdiagonal element of the matrix. So that when you finished, um, when you finish the process, you've got your tridiagonal matrix, and also all the information you want about the PRs. This will be required if you want subsequently to get the vectors is stored in the remaining storage space, and one only needs one other vector to remember essentially that set of quantities for the, uh, for the uh, n minus two successive stages. Now, at that stage, we found, uh, rather to our delight, that we could, in fact, form the product of the p's. Um, we, we need the product of p1, p2, up to pn minus two. Uh, and we found that we could f overwrite it on this square um, without destroying the, p the, the successive PRs until we'd actually used them. Um, a thing which may look rather obvious if the first time you ever meet it is just by reading it, uh, but I can assure you it wasn't quite as obvious as we did it, or at least for several years uh, people uh, 
uh, didn't realize it was so and it needed auxiliary storage space. The point is, if you look at the final, the final p in the sequence, the point is you must multiply the p's in the reverse order. You must multiply them up that order, which is the reverse way to the way you get them. Uh, the pn minus 2 will consist of i minus 2 uh, uh, twice the last u, and the last u will merely have two non-zero components. So the corresponding p matrix uh, really looks like just like that. And the next stage is that we will multiply it by the next uh, p in the, in the game, and that will be associated with the u with three elements, which will multiply into this and just form a matrix, which is the identity matrix apart from that three by three column. So if you hold your fire until you've completed the reduction and then proceed to multiply the, uh, the p's, or to, to take the stored information about the p's and multiply them together, provided you multiply them in the reverse order, you can gradually write the information here and you don't destroy any of the u's uh, before you need them. And so when you finish thread two, well, what you have is not only the tridiagonal matrix, but also the product of all the transformations neatly stored in the same square. In thread one, you're not, uh, you're not expecting, perhaps, to find all the eigenvectors, um, and so you don't uh, necessarily want to mod uh, modify all the p's together. What you're going to do is you're going to, ta you're going to take your tridiagonal matrix and find its eigenvalues, and probably some of its eigenvectors by some method, and then multiply those vectors by the transformation. And if you do that, it's better not to, uh, not to form the product of them. So thread one uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't um, have that final bit in which you multiply all the p's together explicitly. But I should emphasize once again the one thing you never do is to, to, to write down a p explicitly. I mean, even p1 is a, is a full matrix. Uh, or sorry, p1 is a, a matrix which was full, apart from its first row and column. Uh, it's always retained in its factorized form. And this is true at, 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 in, in, at every stage at which we use the algorithm. Well, what about thread three? Well, here we come on to the problem of economy of storage. And of course, in a symmetric matrix, one doesn't really need an, an, an n by n store to hold the thing. Uh, you can store all the thing in half n into n plus two storage spaces just by c uh, having a linear array which contains the, the first row and bit of the second and so on. And then with rather more complicated red tape, you can express the whole process just in terms of these elements. A thread three is um, uh, slightly slower, therefore, not as much slower as we feared, I think, um, and you get away with the storage uh, of uh, uh, just, the, um, ha uh, just about half as much storage as you do in thread one and thread two. Of course, in thread two, there's no incentive to be econ economical because you intend anyway to multiply your p's together to form this orthogonal matrix here, and that's an n by n matrix anyway, and so you wouldn't, uh, if you were using thread two, there's no, no incentive to, 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 to have this economy since you couldn't maintain it. The um, Giddens transformation, uh, which I think, not, uh, although it's not used in the handbook, is not irrelevant from the point of view of our discussion, did the same thing by plane rotations. It's perhaps rather easier to describe. Uh, we start off with, the, with introducing zeros in the first columns. It does a plane rotation in the 2-3 uh, in the two three plane. The cosine, the sine chosen, says to make that zero. And of course, symmetry, uh, because of symmetry, that, so <laughs> that's a rather poor version of symmetry. Um, because of symmetry, th that one becomes zero. Now you do a rotation in the 2-4 two th two plane, uh, so as to make that zero and then in the 2-5 plane to make that zero, and so on. Uh, and now we got the tridiagonal in its first row and column, and now you go on rotation in the 3-4, rotation in the 3-5, and so on, and finally rotation in the 4-5, and of course again, zeros produced by earlier steps are maintained, and in the half n squared, 
transformations, you've got it to tridiagonal form. Now, of course, the interesting thing is the tridiagonal form is the same in both cases um, because you end up with this situation. Um, you've got QTAQ is tridiagonal. And uh, what I assert is that if you did the two processes exactly, the product uh, of, of all the, the P's on the one hand and the plane rotations on the other would be the same, essentially the same anyway, and the T would be the, um, uh, would be the same triagonal, tridiagonal matrix. By essentially the same, I mean uh, that there are possible sign difference between elements. To see that so, we see that, that if we have any orthogonal matrix that does it, we have that AQ is equal to QT. Um, now, the first but the point about it is that the Q we get from householder's reduction and from the Gibbons reduction, in both cases, the first column is the identity matrix. If you look at the Gibbons transformation, you multiply them all together, you do a, a, an R2, 2, 3 rotation first, and then you do a, a 2, 4 rotation, and you see that the zeros in there persist so that um, the Q obtained by Gibbons has E1 as its first column. Well, the same thing happens in the householder. The first householder matrix you use has a U with a one zero components, and all subsequent ones have more than a, a more zero components. And so again, the Q you get from either method uh, has its first column equal to E1. Well, that's the essential point in the proof. Uh, proof happens to be rather more important than it and it might appear. And what I assert is that if you have matrices A and T and an orthogonal, uh, an orthogonal Q uh, satisfying this relation, then everything is determined by the first column of Q. Once the if the first column of Q is known, everything is known. Well, the thing to do is to write this AQ1 QN is equal to Q1 up to QN times T. And Equate it column by column. Q1 by definition is known. AQ1 is therefore equal to T11 times Q1 plus T21 um, <coughs> T times Q2. And Q2 has to be orthogonal to Q1, so multiplying through by Q1, we get that T11 is Q1 T AQ1. And so we now know T11, and therefore uh, we can take it the other side, and we have T21, Q2 is AQ1 minus T11, Q1. And I've just shown that that is determined entirely as once Q1 is given, and therefore Q2 is the unit vector in that direction, and T21 is the length of that vector, uh, and we just have the possibility of t two sign choices. So we see now that Q2 and the first column of T uh, are defined. Well, if you go on like this, equating them column by column, and taking account of the uh, uh, orthogonality, you see that the whole of T and the whole of Q is determined, and therefore the householder and the Gibbons must end up with the uh, same, uh, same matrix, same tridiagonal matrix. Now, the proof, in fact, breaks down if in this tridiagonal matrix you find that any of the subdiagonal elements is Q, you find uh, Q2 is only uniquely determined if this vector is not null. If that vector is not null, T21 is, is zero, and Q is then any vector uh, which is orthogonal to Q1. And you have the same situation at each stage. Uh, in general, you'll have a T i plus one i here, and if that is zero, the next Q is not uniquely determined. And so, um, in the particular case, when a, a zero subdiagonal em element emerges, Gibbons and Householder could you lead to entirely different tridiagonal matrices. Though, of course, they would uh, both have the same eigenvalues and the same eigenvalues as the original matrix. Now, what implication does that have for the numerical stability of the process? Well, the important thing to remember about the numerical, uh, numerical stability that if you, if you go through the error analysis, what it shows in for both processes, it shows that the T that you obtain is some exact orthogonal transformation 
of A plus E, where E is a symmetric perturbation, and it proves that E is small. And uh, you get the same result for Gibbons uh, and for Hausfarner. So the, in, in the Gibbons case, you get the tie diagonal is orthogonally similar to some small perturbation of the original thing, and and the same is true of the house order, and you get uh, slightly different bounds here and different matrices. Now we've seen in the case when a zero subdiagonal element emerged, uh, that you wouldn't get uniqueness. So um, in that case, the the t's uh, coming from the two exact phrases would, would of course be would, would of course be different. And so you would expect in practice that when an off-diagonal element in T is small, uh, there might be considerable divergences between the computed Gibbons and the computed house order. This wouldn't matter because they're both exactly similar to something close to A. And we're not really at all interested in getting T accurately. All we want to do is to get a T which has accurate, uh, the accurately the eigenvalues of A. That, that's a really important thing. And that this process, both processes ensure. Well, you might say, uh, is a, a very small uh, off-diagonal element at all likely? Um, and the answer is, uh, yes, it does occur quite frequently. In fact, in theory, if A had a double root, you would always get one, at least one zero here, because a tridiagonal matrix can't have a multiple root if all the betas, if all the off-diagonal elements are non-zero. So let us consider what should happen in practice if you had a double root. If you had a double root, there should come a time when the next diagonal element to be computed is going to be zero. But that diagonal element will be the sum of the squares of all these elements, square root of the sum, of, and therefore there ought to come a time when all the elements here uh, are zero. And you can see when that happens, it would mean the next transformation wasn't determined. In fact, in this particular case, you could do an arbitrary transformation next time. It would still preserve the, ze uh, the zeros you wanted would already be there. And if you did an arbitrary transformation, they would still be there. And so you get all sorts of transformations, which will give you this, uh, a, a tridiagonal form similar to the original one. So what happens in practice, usually, when you have a multiple root, is there comes a time when these are all just rounding errors. And the next the set of cosines and sines are determined are the ratio of these rounding errors, and so entirely different on one computer from what they are on another. Uh, but it has no effect on the accuracy of the eigenvalues or of the eigenvectors. So it just, just, just means that T itself isn't well determined. In spite of sort of having realized this quite early on and having done this error analysis, I did fall into the trap because at the time when I first made up the householder program, uh, we just got our new computer working in 59. I already had the Gibbons process, and I took a matrix I just uh, 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 used, used the Gibbons process on, on, on the juice in the one room, and did house on the other room, and I got my tridiagonal matrix, and it agreed quite well, and then it gradually got rather poor, and toward the end it differed entirely. And I just made up the householder program. I said to myself, oh, I've got some error in it. And spent a long time looking for it. And when it suddenly dawned on me, of course, there was no reason why they should be the same. It did happen that I'd chosen a matrix which uh, had an exact double root. Um, and in fact, the householder program I made was correct. Despite of producing an entirely different tridiagonal matrix in the bottom, it still gave the same eigenvalues uh, to working accuracy as the Gibbons one did. So. You're never too old to make a mistake, which you <laughs> uh, I sh should have known that perhaps more than anybody else because I've always made a rather strong point of this <laughs> issue. <laughs> well, now we come then to find finding the eigenvalues of a tridiagonal matrix and um, quite an, uh, a symmetric tridiagonal matrix. Perhaps, perhaps I should clear up one point before we go on. Uh, one could, of course, do exactly similar trans uh, exactly analogous transformations in the case when A is Hermitian. When A is Hermitian, it can be reduced uh, by the, in, in exactly the same way by a finite number of elementary Hermitians uh, to, tri to Hermitian tridiagonal forms. 
Um, and uh, we didn't originally include it in the handbook. I don't quite know why, because I think Hermitian matrices are quite um, important in practice. But we have subsequently done it, and it has been done here. Um, the increasing complexity is not so severe as you might think, because a Hermitian matrix is only, uh, only very slightly complex. It's really a, a, a real matrix rather thinly disguised. And the only time that you're really involved in complex arithmetic is in the reduction to tridiagonal form. Uh, it gives a tridiagonal form, uh, alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha n. Uh, and if you look at the corresponding betas, uh, they, they will look like that. Just this, this, this beta here. Uh, sorry, they will look like that. They will be complex conjugates, of course. And at that stage, of course, you can make the whole thing real uh, just by multiplying by a diagonal uh, uh, unitary transformation. And from then on, you have a real symmetric tridiagonal matrix. Its eigenvalues and eigenvectors will be real. And so you don't have the usual relationship to the amount of extra work to be done in the complex emission case. The ratio is not the same as it is between a real matrix and a general, uh, a general real matrix and a general complex matrix. Uh, the versions that we have at MPL and the ones that uh, they have in IcePAC are slightly different. Um, I think there's one point at which we have an advantage on storage. Uh, originally, we just used one square to store the thing, and we have the real part there, and we have the imaginary part there. Unfortunately, you can store all the imaginary part there because the diagonal imaginary part is zero for a emission matrix, so the whole thing goes uh, into the square matrix. So one or two other minor differences, and I don't, I don't know with, with whom the advantage lies. I think you would agree in both cases the emission program is surprisingly fast. I should mention that an earlier version of done, uh, this was done some time ago by uh, Don Muller, was it? Don, Don Muller, yeah, De Dennis Muller, yeah, yeah. yes. And uh, the program that was finally done is related to his, but, but uh, it is uh, in it quite a considerable improvement on it in a number of number of details. Right, so whether, whether you had a complex Hermitian or a real symmetric, you certainly end up with dealing with a real symmetric tridiagonal matrix. And the first, um, and now you're, you're faced with uh, doing one of two things. You may want just to find its eigenvalues, or you may want its, all its eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Uh, you may want some or no eigenvectors and so on. And the first technique that I'm going to describe is particularly flexible. It's for finding eigenvalues. And it's uh, flexible in that it enables you to find uh, just isolated eigenvalues, eigenvalues in a given region, and, or, 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 or eigenvalues by number. It has great flexibility as regards its selectivity. And it's based on the Sturm sequence property of leading principal minors of a symmetric tridiagonal matrix. Well, leading principal minors of any symmetric matrix, for that matter. But it can be shown, it's standard uh, classical theory, that the eigenvalues of leading principal minors interlace each other. And from this, it follows it's, uh, that you, the principal minors form a Sturm sequence. Pr principal minors of T minus lambda i form a Sturm sequence. And it's this property that is used to find the eigenvalues. Now, that in, in the in ISPAC and, uh, and in the handbook, there are two programs associated with this, bisect and um, tristerm. I'll talk about bisect at first. Well, let's see the basic idea of the method. Uh, you've got a tridiagonal matrix. And let's suppose that you, let's concentrate for the moment on finding just one eigenvalue, uh, the rth, and see how it works. Uh, supposing, uh, supposing we uh, have upper and lower bounds so that we know that the number of eigenvalues bigger than lambda, uh, b bigger than this upper bound, is, is less than r. And the number of eigenvalues bigger than this is greater than or equal to r. Now, from the Sturm sequence property, given any v numerical value of lambda, we can determine how many eigenvalues are greater uh, than that particular value. What you do is you form your matrix, t minus lambda i, which has elements alpha i minus lambda, 
and the off-diagonal minimums are beta i, and you calculate the principal minors. If you call the first one, define the first one to be 1 in all cases, p1 to be alpha 1 minus lambda, and then the later ones satisfy pr lambda is alpha r minus lambda into pr minus 1 lambda minus beta r squared pr minus 2 lambda. So you have that simple uh, recurrent relation satisfied pr minus 1 uh, between uh, successive members of the sequence. So in, uh, with uh, um, very little computation, for a given value of lambda, you can get the sequence p0, p1, up to pn. And if you look, look at the sine sequence here, and then you count the number of agreements in sign between consecutive elements, then the number of agreements is equal to the number of eigenvalues which are greater than the value of lambda that you've used. So given an upper and lower bound, uh, you can uh, bisect, it take you take the middle point, form the, calculate the Sturm sequence for that middle point. If the number of eigenvalues bigger than that is greater than or equal to r, your rth eigenvalue is in there. If it's less than, uh, less than r, uh, then your rth eigenvalue is in there. And therefore, by su successive bisection, you can locate the eigenvalue uh, in an interval of any width you like. Uh, well, in practice, of course, one can do rather better than this. Uh, I'm just concentrated on one. But each time you go through the sequence, if you start off with a series of upper and lower uh, bounds for the ones that you want, each time you go through the sequence, you are likely to get some information not only about the one you're just uh, dealing with at the moment, but also about the others. And I think in the, uh, in the two versions that we have, we, we extract the maximum amount of information that you can get out of each Sturm sequence count. Um, the process is interesting for historical reasons in connection with, with um, error analysis because um, it's one of the, one of the more satisfactory uh, error analyses that occur in the literature. Uh, Given showed that this was, had remarkable stability um, and showed that eigenvalues were always calculated. Um, uh, could, could, uh, any eigenvalue could be computed with an error which was um, related to the uh, machine precision, which I always called 2 to the minus t, and the lar largest eigenvalue with a small multiple, which was independent of n. So you got very, very good determination uh, of, of all our eigenvalues. That is, a determination with a low error relative to the norm, which in this case, of course, is the eigenvalue of largest modulus. The fact that it didn't involve, uh, uh, that this error bound didn't involve n, of course, a very pretty thing about it. Proof was done for fixed point, which is now usually done in floating point, and in floating point it is very easy, and perhaps is gee, one of the, uh, huh, how are we done? <laughs> um, perhaps one of the, the triumphs of error analysis. Now, it, it happens that this process is rather, um, rather dangerous as regards underflow and overflow. I used it a great deal on a computer in the early days where I had one whole word for my exponent, and uh, overflow and underflow were not uh, very commonly occurring phenomena, certainly didn't occur in this. And then when I started to use a, a high-level language, I realized it ran into trouble, and it turned out to be better to reframe these and to use PR lambda over PR mi minus one lambda, which are called QR lambda, and th they satisfy a simpler recurrence relation. QR lambda equals alpha R minus lambda minus beta R squared over QR minus one lambda. At first sight, it looks more dangerous because there's a division, but it turns out that that doesn't cause any trouble. It doesn't even cause any trouble if Q is zero. You only have to replace it by something very small, and then, uh, <coughs> Uh, 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 and then you can carry on the process. Underflow and overflow uh, uh, are really almost impossible in, in, in any reasonable circumstances with this modified thing, and it's now always done. Well, many people think they've discovered this, but in fact it's quite old, and, and theoretical physicists tend to use this process before Gibbons recommended it, um, uh, before Gibbons recommended this. So in, in a sense, it's older, though not 
perhaps used in this particular way. And of course, it's obvious connections with continued fraction uh, process. Well, it's this thing that occurs in the handbook. Uh, and it's, it's interesting uh, that the QRs are the quantities you get by Gaussian elimination without pivoting uh, on, uh, applied to T minus lambda i. Now, Gaussian elimination without pivoting is known to be a most reprehensible thing. And the interesting thing is that for tridiagonal matrices, it turns out not to be reprehensible as far as the determinant calculation is concerned, though it would be for solving linear equations. And fortunately, it's determinants that we're interested in. What does this become for QRs? Well, it c you just count the number of positive QRs now. Uh, the QRs are rather nicer because in, in the days when one used the PRs, one had to have a special case to deal with the, the situation when there were ze a zero beta occurs. And in Gibbons' original paper, he did deal with that special case. I think made a slight error in doing so, which was the subsequent of several later communications. Well, you get over this you get over this little worry if you use this thing. Zero betas don't come into it at all. You, you just count the number of positive things. And in case, if it was diagonal, it still worked. You don't have to do anything, anything different. Okay, well, perhaps I, I should stop. <laughs>